Welcome again to everyone here, both in person and on the live stream, even those of you joining us from the future. We come together from a variety of paths, experiencers who bring their accounts, researchers who bring their commitment to science, reporters who bring their commitment to uncovering truth and exposing realities beyond what are conventionally understood, all bringing your curiosity, all bringing your commitment to be in this conversation. It's profoundly important to create communities of conversation, sharing from the various paths we come from, standing in truth, open to exploration, and looking ahead for all that is yet to come forward with a great debt of gratitude to those who brought us to this point today. Many of us here, whether we tell others or not, whether we're public about it or not, have had our own anomalous experiences. I myself have had my own. And sometimes people ask, what is it, why is it, that I don't get quite as much flack about that as many people have in the past? Part of it, <clears throat> part of it, I think, is because of people like Randy Nickerson, who's here in the audience today. Randy was brave enough to come forward decades ago in a di very different time for the public's engagement with the anomalous. Where's Randy? <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Thank you so much. Randy continues to advocate for other experiencers as well as in his recent movie, The Aerial Phenomenon, a remarkable and deeply resonant film. It's also due to people like Bud Hopkins, who by all accounts live very vibrantly in this very neighborhood about 10 blocks from where we are right now. We've also benefited deeply from every one of the speakers we have here today in the incredible work each of them have done to normalize and destigmatize these topics through their own persistence and borderline superhuman acts. As many have to do quietly, privately, I've worked hard through my own practice and through the experiencer group to process and integrate these experiences into my life. I'm pretty open about them and have talked about them plenty in the past and I'm sure will again in the future. Though I often let them reside in my mind within a larger framework for how I approach the world, allowing them to actually become more like a mortar and a foundation of my outlook, that has given me the ability to run the experiencer group and organize events like today's conference. I say mortar, but in reality that foundation is more like the sturdy, flexible wings of an aircraft. Two of them, of course, reflecting the consensus reality we encounter in day-to-day -day life and the other more personal and much stranger framework that many of us have also experienced. I learned to embrace that flexibility in large part from the work of our first speaker today, Jeffrey J. Kreifel. At the archives of the Impossible Conference earlier this year, Jeff talked about what he calls refusal to land, the superhuman ability to keep many possibilities in play and refuse to come up with easy, relaxing solutions to these enduring mysteries. In his, in his new book, The Superhumanities, uh, Jeff says, as an aging academic who usually does not feel very super, there's, there's an understatement, he says, I am quite certain that I'm wrong about any number of things. I don't care. We don't have time for being right about everything. The important thing is to get the ideas out there. My colleagues, students, and readers can then agree or disagree with these ideas, reject them, correct them, nuance them, or develop them further. In essence, overcome me. So be it. They are the future superhumans to whom I look forward, for whom I experiment, and for whom I want to know. So let's welcome to the stage and, we'll, and watch how he navigates the winds today, a kind of aerial phenomenon himself. <laughs> with his superhuman ability to stay in the air. Please help me welcome to the stage, Jeff Greipel. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Kelly, Priscilla, James. Really appreciate being up here. I, I'm going to read uh, my lecture, and I'm going to tell you why, though, first. I'm going to rationalize it. Um, people contact me all the time and they say, I really want to meet you. I want to meet you. And I'm like, that's a bad idea. I'll clearly disappoint you. Um, just stick with the books. 
stick with the text. And so I like to stick with the text. It's It'll present some ideas to you. <clears throat> the ideas will be up here on the screen. I'll only talk for about four hours, maybe. Um, no, I'll, it'll take 45 minutes, and then we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. And I think at that point, we'll, we'll have some things to do. So here, here, here goes the talk. I want to jump right in with, this is really a report from the academic front. It's, it's, it's really a report from how this looks and sounds in the universities and colleges, which I think are really important cultural institutions. I think all of us probably in this room were at some point trained in those institutions. Um, and even people who disagree with us send their kids to us. So I, th I find that really interesting. And, and so I'm really concerned about essentially mainstreaming this in, into the academy. I'll talk a lot about that. And it's going to sound a bit nerdy, but, but um, I think it'll work. Here are what I call the three bars. Um, these are the three bars that intellectuals um, can get over when they're thinking about anomalous phenomena, maybe that you can try as well. The first bar, I think most of us in this room are probably over, over already. The question is, do these anomalous experiences happen? I can assure you, sure, I can assure you that most intellectuals and scientists answer the first and the negative. They, they simply don't believe it, and they come up with all kinds of easy explanations why, none of which work, but, but that's what they do. The second bar is, if these things happen, do they tell us something about the nature of consciousness or mind? In other words, do they tell us something about subjectivity? I think a lot of us are probably over that bar as well. The third bar is the one that most people do not get over. Can they tell us something about the nature of nature? that is, of space, time, and matter, and what I left off here, the relationship of these things to consciousness. And I think that's really where this stuff goes, um, and, and I'll explain why that, that is so problematic. I think the answer to all three questions is yes. I also think, let me lay my cards on the table, that this is so because there is no final distinction between what we call consciousness and cosmos. Consciousness is cosmic, and the cosmos is conscious. I will not explain such outrageous statements. That would take days. I have tried to do something of that in the books, no doubt, inadequately. Alas, it is always inadequate. It is never enough. It cannot be enough for reasons that I want to explain. I think there are good reasons why it's never enough, and I'll explain those in a minute. Allow me instead first to get at these three questions in a roundabout way. Allow me to tell you a story, the story of how I came to help host the Archives of the Impossible at Rice University. This is a piece that appeared in Rice Magazine the fall before the conference, so about a year ago now. Allow me also to be what I happen to be, an academic, a professor, a historian of religions, a nerd who loves books, strange words, and even stranger people. I do so not to be jargony or opaque or trendy. I do so to be precise and advance our conversation. I actually think that what we call the humanities possesses immense resources for this conversation. They are not perfect, they are not adequate either, but they are a very good beginning, especially in their acute historical forms of consciousness and their approach to knowledge as socially constructed. I'm going to explain both of those questions. They're really, they're really crucial, and I think it's why a lot of this stuff is not understood. What we have come to think in the humanities is that our modern sensibilities around pretty much everything, including the self, society, secularism, science, matter, and mind, are socially and historically constructed. They are not innocent, natural, or universal. Even the conditioned sensorium of the body and brain, what we experience to be true with our senses and thoughts, 
are in historical fact based on centuries of affirmation and denial, physical or threatened violence directed at precisely these same anomalous experiences, colonial, imperial, and racist projects, and elaborate technologies, both mental and material. Put bluntly, we are who we are because of what our ancestors did and did not do, because of who won and who lost. And yet, and yet reality is always punching holes in our historical and social constructions, in those ancestors who won. Much of this hole punching, moreover, displays fantastic correspondences between the human being and the larger environment, suggesting in the end that our divisions between the inside and the outside, between the subject and the object, and everything that this split produces in our minds are not finally so, not at least in any ultimate sense. This is the great secret that I wish to whisper to you this afternoon. Reality only appears to be divided into mind and matter, into consciousness and cosmos, because you experience it as so. You are the splitter of the real. And when you go, so does the split. It is temporary. I should add that I am not at all certain that we are up to this secret. Perhaps this is why it still remains a whisper. People are afraid. The secret, after all, implies their ending. That is the first and perhaps the most basic reason that no explanation of this conscious cosmos is ever adequate or can be adequate. We do not want to hear it. We actually cannot hear it as us. We cannot hear this great secret because these social constructions enacted over centuries and in multiple cultural zones were incredibly effective. They created the negotiations, bigotries, compromises, fears, and paradoxes that are us. They have been des devastatingly myopic. This repression, after all, renders us basically inept, incapable of understanding, much less accepting, extremely common human experiences that violate our assumed splits between consciousness and cosmos, or between mind and matter. We think these events are impossible, but they are only impossible within our historically constructed frameworks. But most sim simply, our conclusions are a function of our exclusion. Okay? In other words, we think what is real is real because of all the things we've taken off the table. If you just put those things on the table, that's not reality anymore, and suddenly you can't explain what's on the table. I say this all the time to my colleagues who think they can explain everything. I say, of course you can explain everything. You just took everything off the table you can't explain. No, it's, it's really not simple. I've never gotten laughs or claps for that. All right. In 2010, I published an intellectual history of a most abused word, the paranormal. The book was Authors of the Impossible. The philosophical associations and scientific nuances of the paranormal, it was, by, by the way, first coined in French in 1903 as the paranormal. These, these complexes were complex and subtle. The word signaled something entirely natural, but well beyond our present science, something supernatural, two words. The technical term paranormal, please note, did not come to be in the tabloids, but in some of the most elite intellectuals and academic locations on the planet. Institutions like Cambridge, Stanford, Harvard, Duke, Princeton, and the University of Virginia all spawned research programs where these phenomena were called any number of names. The word psychical actually was coined in 1875 by a British chemist and physicist by the name of Sir William Crookes. 
The term superhuman was used by Alfred Russell Wallace, who co-discovered the principles of natural selection with Charles Darwin. He used it in uh, 1876. The word superhuman, or ubermenschlich, was used consistently by Friedrich Nietzsche from 1881 to 1889. The word supernormal was coined probably by the classicist Frederick Myers, trained at Cambridge, came into use in the 1880s. The word superhuman was used again by William James at Harvard extensively in his last published book in 1909, right before he died. And the word parapsychological was used by two University of Chicago botanists, both with PhDs in botany, by the way, J.B. and Louisa Ryan at Duke. They were drawing the word from an earlier German thinker named Max Dessoir, who coined it in the 1880s. So all of these words are actually, as I like to say to my colleagues, these are our words. These are, these are technical terms. These are not things you just throw out there. And so we come to the late 20th century when a French writer like Amy Michel will write of la pensée sur human, literally a kind of superhuman thinking. The newly invented words just kept coming and coming and coming. It was as if scientists and intellectuals wanted to name something that could not be named. The same continues today, and so here we are. I have tried my own hand at this. By an author of The Impossible, I mean an author who writes about common human experiences that are not supposed to happen but do anyway, and who, by writing and theorizing about these impossible things, renders them newly plausible, imaginable, thinkable, in a word, real. I mean an author who makes the impossible possible. And the, the easiest explanation I can give of this is just it's an analogy in the early... 1700s, if you were living in France and you were talking to an urban intellectual, he, and it was always a he, would tell you how stupid the peasants and farmers were in the countryside for believing that rocks fall from the sky. Okay? Rocks don't fall from the sky. That's stupid, as they would say. But of course, the peasants and the farmers were just reporting their experiences, and it turns out rocks do fall from the sky. Um, but what you need is a new model of the universe that could make what was impossible possible. And so that's what I mean by this phrase, the impossible. What we need is a theory. We don't need more data, folks. We've got plenty of data. We've got more data than we can possibly talk about. What we need is a model to put it into some kind of framework that people can say, oh, of course that happened. Of course rocks fall from the sky. That's what we need. I featured four such authors in the book. One was Jacques Vallée, a French-born American astronomer, computer scientist, and investor in advanced biomedical technology who has written numerous acclaimed books about the UFO phenomenon. Jacques was also the basis of the French scientist in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a film on whose set Jacques served as a consultant. Sometime in the early winter of 2014, I was with Jacques in Berkeley, California, when he asked me a question. He was beginning to worry about his correspondence and research files, and he wanted to know if I had any suggestions about a university that might preserve them. A long conversation and other visits to San Francisco came to conclusion when Jacques visited Rice in March of 2016, and agreed to a major gift. There were a lot of complexities, including confidentiality, which we can talk about later. I then approached another key figure who was in this very room um, with the same possibility in mind, Whitley Strieber. Whitley is a horror and science fiction writer who also wrote what is without doubt the finest autobiographical abduction account of the 20th century, a book called Communion. Whitley also happens to be a Texan, having grown up in San Antonio, Willie responded enthusiastically and donated about 5,000 letters he had received from individuals who recognized their own contact experience in his. He actually received about a quarter of a million, but his wife, Anne, had crystallized these down to 5,000 and then again to about 800 that they had typed up. Then came Edwin May. Ed was the nuclear physicist who led the U.S. government's classified remote viewing 
or Psychic Espionage Program from 1985 to 1995. The project was founded in 1972 by two other physicists or scientists, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. At one point called Project Stargate, this was a serious enterprise that was well-funded by government agencies for over two decades, really three decades, mostly because, as May has repeatedly argued, the remote viewers consistently obtained empirical results that were impossible to deny. So this, this gets at that third bar again. I was talking about The intellectual gifts of Valet, Strieber, and May created a kind of black hole effect, kind of a gravitas. Soon, others were attracted by their gravitational pull and approached us with their own offers of generosity. It's actually a kind of a sweet deal for a researcher because otherwise your, your files are just, they're going to be, they're going to disappear. They're going to disappear into the antiquarian book market or your kids are going to throw them away or they're going to rot in a basement or an attic. So the researchers find this actually really attractive because it, it preserves their, their research really presumably for, for a long, long, long time. So today we have scientific studies of unexplained aerial phenomena from a scientist named Richard Haynes. We have the history of the UFO in the U.S. and Europe from a Pentagon worker named Larry Bryant, who's no longer with us, and Paola Harris Leopizzi, an American-Italian journalist and writer. We have the history and practice of physical mediumship, British physical medium named Stuart Alexander, um, that Leslie helped us acquire, the interactions of anthropology and parapsychology from an anthropologist named Stanley Krippner, and collections of popular culture and the paranormal from Eric Davis. The overall sum of the growing collection must number into the hundreds of thousands or even over a million documents, letters, books, film, and recordings. No, we have an art. It's an ongoing kind of project. And the sum is greater than the parts. The project as a whole is based on the working hypothesis that it is all connected. I think that's what we're about to do here. From the UFO and the NDE, through the poltergeist, the medium, and the afterlife, to the angel, the alien, the precognitive dream, the telepathic communication, and the abduction event. That is, after all, why all of this material sits in the same archival collection, Collecting is connecting. Collection is connection. It may not be all connected, of course, and it is indeed very difficult to separate the endless weaves and webs of physical events and actual experiences. Intentional fakery, fraud and disinformation, psychopathology, and traumatic inrush. Still serious researchers in these realms often conclude that much of it is indeed connected. I agree with the psychologist Edsel Cardenia, who has done so much to classify and understand these anomalies under the banner of altered states of consciousness. Edsel has argued that this research is at an early stage, mostly because our academic cultures simply have not tried. A quote, the study of altered states of consciousness currently is at a similar stage to where botany was before Linnaeus proposed his taxonomy, namely a collection of interesting observations lacking enough organization and integration to make theoretical and empirical sense of it. What we can do is describe and tell stories. We, don't, we haven't got to the genetics part. We don't know anything about the DNA of this. We're, we're, we're not even at Linnaeus. Okay, we're way back. <clears throat> Such ignorance and neglect do not have to be so, and it often has not been so. As Cordania also points out, such altered states were central to many of the movements that formed the modern humanities, from the romantic literary movement of poetry and popular novel or fiction to the surrealist artistic movement of automatic writing, symbol, and trance, to the contemporary fascination in television with 20th century series like The Twilight Zone and The X-Files. We could also easily d discuss films like Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which, by the way, was clearly based on Nietzsche's evolving superhumans, 
to Denise Villeneuve's arrival, 2016, which privileges, again, much like Nietzsche, a circular view of temporality and the subsequent importance of precognition. Indeed, a discussion of the impossible in modern television and film could go on for many days here. I actually think this is a really, really important issue. Um, Meg Whitley is a, is a good example of this. He's a horror and science fiction writer who writes about abductions and contact experiences now. So that, that, that relationship between fiction as literature and fiction as fraud is, is, is a kind of modern thing we're in. I think we haven't really thought our way out of it. And of course, if you just think about your own lives, where in our culture is the paranormal robustly discussed? It's on Netflix, right? It's on Amazon Prime. It's on, I mean, it's, it's streaming into your freaking home right now. Um, but it's always presented as entertainment. It's always presented as fiction. It's never presented as the truth of our, our cosmic condition. So it's, it's as if we can entertain it, but we can't entertain it. I think that's sort of where we're at. <clears throat> the impossible then is right in front of our eyes. We're literally watching it. But we are also siloing it into entertainment and fantasy. We are following in the footsteps of our academic ancestors, repressing our own supernatures, while affirming a very specific form of rationality. We are defining what nature gets to do, of course, all the while saying that it isn't doing what it is obviously doing. To use an American political metaphor, I'm, I'm from Texas, by the way, so this means something to me. We are gerrymandering reality to fit our, to fit our flat materialist science and local academic. That's what we're doing. That's why we keep winning, is we just keep carving up the, the map so we can win the election. Not that incorporating the impossible into the possible will ever be easy. I'm not suggesting that. The phenomena are themselves trickster-like with respect to the rational ego. They represent other models of mind that far transcend any strictly um, e egoic rationalities that are accepted today. If you will, the impossible is elusive by nature. As one of my colleagues, Alexander Regi, has put it so well, respect to romantic literature and enlightenment rationalism, there is often a kind of tyranny of clarity at work. I really want to stress this. I think a lot of us are guilty of this. We, we want a clear explanation, and it's, it ain't coming, folks. Um, but it ain't coming for a reason. The rational ego ignores all that it cannot explain and so comes to a view of reality that it can explain and control. The result is clarity and control, but also an impoverished view of reality that has no place in it for us. Such a tyranny of clarity and actual fact occludes, erases, renders invisible precisely that which is appearing all the time in these altered states of mind. To invoke an astronomical metaphor, the stars cannot be seen at the brightness of midday. They are completely invisible. If we only had noon in which to see, none of us would believe that we are in fact floating in a sea of stars right now. If all I had was noon to prove to you that there are stars in the sky, you would, guess what? You wouldn't believe me. You'd think I was a fool. But if we walk out at midnight, guess what? It, it turns out I'm right. So midnight stands in for the altered states of consciousness in which the impossible so often appears. Uh, the midday stun here is rational consciousness and its commitment to the senses. One occludes the other. They are both so, but not at the same time. Okay, so I'm not dismissing reason or science or, or midday view. I'm just saying there's also there's a midnight life here that we have as well. This is another reason why the great secret cannot be heard by us as egos. We think we are just the midday rational egos. As such, we ignore and demean alternative forms of rationality that are us as well. This is why I think one quickly becomes 
baffled, befuddled, and bedazzled in these archives or in this group. Basically, we are approaching midnight at noon. So we're all, in, we're all sitting at noon. We're, we're expecting that we'll understand midnight. You, you won't. Yeah, it's not possible. All right. Waking up inside a store. Let us be aware that such a project of collecting as connecting, of comparing strange things and arriving at even stranger conclusions, is neither innocent nor neutral. In academic speak, we are working toward a new critical theory that is neither modern nor postmodern, neither posthuman nor transhuman. This is neither anthropology nor religious studies as conventionally construed along rational or historical lines. It is something else. As the Duke literary critic Priscilla Wald has put it so powerfully, the phenomena subverts every social construction, including unjust and immoral ones. This is why these same impossible phenomena in 19th century American spiritualism, for example, have been linked so tightly to social justice and the envisioning of new moral norms around gender, sexuality, and race. Um, the spiritualists, by the way, they were radical. I mean, they were saying things about sexuality and race we're still not saying. Uh, and that was almost 200 years ago, 175 years ago. As a scholar of religion and race, Stephen Finley has taught us over the years, this is also why African-American visionaries are often so attracted and adept at esoteric thinking and ufological vision. They are psychologically and spiritually doubled, split in two by the racist absurdities of society, and so they see right through and beyond these social fictions. Like the UFO, they hover above and outside society, even as, of course, they are also in of it. In the terms of the anthropologist Hussein Ali Agrama, the secular assumptions of the academy are simply not adequate to the high strangeness of the phenomenon, nor are the two certain ways of knowing of what we have come to call science and religion. Neither really work very well. Both need to be left behind at some point, dropped, as Hussein would say, like the too heavy gear of the California firefighters who need to escape a raging fire but cannot if they will not drop their firefighting gear. So Hussein tells his story that the firefighters in California were dying at an alarming rate and they didn't know why. And so they did a, a study of it and they figured out that they were not dropping their surrounded by the air because they had to save this expensive gear. And once they started to drop it and just get the hell out of there, uh, they, a lot more, a lot fewer of them died. And so this becomes a parable for Hussein. It's what we really need to do to understand the anomalous is to drop our gear. And by dropping our gear, he means everything. He means your religious beliefs, your scientific convictions, your secular convictions. He means all of it. You have to drop all of it and just listen to the experience. If I had to crystallize, then, these archives of the impossible down to a single soundbite, this is not really a soundbite, is it? I, I'm sorry. It's, it's wordy. I would say that impossible phenomena, especially of a spontaneous or traumatic nature, and that, by the way, is my real filter. You know, people ask me all the time, what do you do with fraud? What do you do with fake? What do you do with stage magic? I'm like, I don't do it. I don't, I don't study it. I study people who are in a car accident or they get struck by lightning or they're out driving. It's spontaneous. It's traumatic. And it usually completely upends their life. They, they are not in this to make money or to make a living. They don't want this. They don't want this to happen. But it happens anyway. And so I think that's a really good, it's not a perfect filter, but it's a good filter. So these kind of phenomena constitute an awakening inside a story an early and usually coded awareness that we are being written and in ways that we, we may well want to write anew. And the easiest way to explain this is if you talk to experiencers, what they'll often say is, it was as if I were a character in a novel or it was as if I were an actor or an actress in a movie, to which I reply, you were. You're, you're in a movie right now. It's, it's called culture, called language called religion. You're inside a story right now. 
And what these, I think, impossible phenomena are about are breaks or, or eruptions inside that story that's helping the person imagine themselves outside the story. Because some of these stories are nasty. For me. If you haven't noticed, a lot of the stories we live in don't work so well. And, and I think what a lot of these phenomena are about is pushing us, pushing us to tell a different story. Here is the tough part, though. We tell ourselves a story, and we come to think that we are that story. But we are not that story. We are telling that story, and so we are also standing outside it. In the study of religion, we call these stories myths, by which we do not mean untruths or falsehoods, by, but which, by which we mean the water the fish are swimming in that is them and not them. In other words, it's a story so basic you don't even know it's a story. You just think this is the way the world is. That's a myth. That's what we call it. We're caught in it. Please be careful here, though. As Joseph, if Jason, Joseph, this is more directed at my colleagues, probably not even. As Joseph and Storm has reminded us, the claim that one has no myth, no water, is the purest myth of all. This is what academics think. They have no myth. They've grown, they've grown beyond all myths. And Jason says, no, you haven't. This myth of secularism, of having no myths, is precisely the story we have to awaken in and then from now. Not so that we can finally be without myth. That's not possible. But so that we can live in a different myth, tell ourselves a better story, one that is more capacious, more just, and I would add more cosmic. Um, okay, I'm going to skip this. Go to this part. This is the book that that uh, Jay helped. I'll go to this part here. Allow me a, a particular example. I'm going to tell you two stories now that I'm going to shut up. Um, the first is a joke that never works, and I'll I'll explain why. I like to joke that there are only two things you have to understand in order to really understand the UFO, radar and revelation. No one ever laughs. You did not laugh. Probably because it grates too much against our assumptions about the world and ourselves. But the joke is true. Engineering, astronomy, biology, medicine, neuroscience, and physics are as important here as the history of religions, anthropology, philosophy, art, and literary criticism. I have spoken about the UFO to historians, theologians, and literary critics at Harvard, Duke, and Stanford, but I have also spoken to propulsion engineers and federal funding agencies at MIT and sat with neuroscientists, biologists, statisticians, computer scientists, and quantum physicists on advisory boards in Europe and the U.S. So scientists are really interested in this. So are humanists. Whatever these phenomena are, they are inseparable from gravity, space, time, contagion, genetics, evolution, justice, the human brain, predation, trauma, race, sexuality, and yes, consciousness itself. In truth, the study of the impossible is to study everything. But how? How do we step back, take in all the pixels that appear to us, squint a bit? Here, by the way, are a few of them. This is what our archives actually look like if you get into them. There are people drawing pictures of their encounter experiences, and there's all kinds of art. This is a piece somebody did of different discarnate beings that appear, and there's another drawing and a letter, particular account. How do we how do we take all of this in and and create a picture of it? We have no way of accepting, much less understanding, the reality of events that are very, very physical and yet clearly violate our understanding of space, time, matter, and mind. Consider, for example, dreams that are obviously precognitive of the events of the next day, which, by the way, are entirely physical. Or, so how is a subjective event corresponding perfectly to a series of physical events? That makes no sense. 
okay, in, in this, this mo the model we live in. Think about encounters with dead husbands telling their wives where to find the body. I'm always a um, bit, laugh a bit, because when husbands appear to wives, they always apologize. Sorry, honey, I'm dead. You can find my body in the ditch, and then you find the body. Of the, you call the police, and that's what the, the husband always has to start out apologizing for some. If you're married, you understand that. Um, um, humanoids emerging out of nowhere, as we see here. We also have implants in noses, ears, and legs. Super sexualized abductions. Abductions are often heavily implicated in sexuality and gender. Stalled tractors and cars, UFOs do things to vehicles, to technology, to batteries in particular, and a complete violation of something subjective and objective, and military radar returns in the sky, what reduced a lot of our present situation. None of this makes the least bit of sense in our present order of knowledge. So to preserve that order of knowledge, we simply deny it all in a kind of gigantic cop-out or just as bad, we fall into this or that belief system and declare a particular story or mythology. It's extraterrestrials. It's demons. It's God. It's entertainment. Whatever. None of it really works. The situation might seem dire at the moment, but it also seems to be shifting, moving, even occasionally flipping. There is real reason for hope, the New York Times articles that Leslie Kane has co-written since December of 2017 with, with, um, with her colleagues have frankly been game-changing. Ralph Blumenthal is one of them sitting right here. But who really puts these UFO admissions together with Leslie's equally sophisticated work on the survival of bodily death? Who puts the UFO and the NDE together? Yeah, that's really what I want to ask you. I think they're connected. But how? I think we can begin by admitting our own ignorance, by admitting what we do not know and cannot know with our present ways of knowing. Okay. Tell you one more story. Why don't why don't we hear this? What is our problem? I think we keep tripping because we lack an adequate theory of the imagination. It's really where I think a lot of this goes. Um, I actually, I happen to think this is the number one reason we remain baffled. We do not know how to integrate the mental or subjective dimensions of the phenomena, which generally appear precisely through the imagination in its most extreme forms. Basically, we do not know how to read signs. I know from long, long experience that listeners will misunderstand me at this point, so let me explain. By invoking the imagination, I do not mean to suggest that something like UFO encounters or psychedelic experiences are simply imagined. That's not what I'm saying. I do not mean to argue that technological craft, conscious energies, unions with the cosmos, or invisible entities are not involved, are not in the bedroom or forest. Much less do I mean to refer to the ordinary states of fantasy daydreaming. Dreaming. I mean to suggest that the traumatic or psychedelic event has let something in, has opened up the human organism in real and effective ways, whatever or whoever it is that is getting in. I also mean to suggest that these presences are interacting with the human organism in and through that organism's imagination, which is itself a feature of consciousness. The imagination is the privileged organ of contact, communion, and communication. Conventional rationality is mostly impotent. Language and grammar are something of a joke. The senses are certainly not reliable. They evolve for other, much more practical and adaptive reasons. If you want to say something like, well, I won't believe until I see it, then you are making a cardinal mistake that the neuroscience of perception warns us strongly against. If you know anything about the neuroscience of perception, the bottom line is, it ain't what you're seeing. It's not there. Constructing it inside your head. The imagination is of a different order, although, of course, it also uses sensory cues and content. And these, of course, are not always light on. 
By invoking the imagination, then, I intend to refer to especially rare or palpably felt, often literally electric or electromagnetic altered states of mind. A movie just goes off in the imaginal consciousness of the individual seer. Perhaps such a movie is triggered or activated by a psychoactive molecule or a non-human or superhuman presence. In any sense, the person in question does not imagine such things. The person is shown such things. Hence the revelation. Revelation is always a passive experience. You don't make it up. It's something that comes to you. And yes, yes, absolutely, yes, there are objective physical correlates to these experiences. Although what exactly objective means here is up for grabs, there are hard UFO phenomena. <clears throat> it is also worth reminding my, re my readers, or in this case my listeners, that the imagination shows every sign of being capable of affecting physical objects. Advance. This is, again, the third bar, something people have a hard time with. Think flying or falling objects in poltergeist events, symbolically signaling anxiety, anger, or some unresolved trauma. Poltergeist effects are physical events. Pans fly around the room. Curtains catch on fire. People get scratched. Physical things happen. And it always has something to do with anger or trauma. It, puppy dogs don't appear in poltergeist effect. Right? There are no rainbows. There are no uh, unicorns from your daughter's bedroom. There, nasty stuff is happening, but it's always something physical that's coding something uh, subjective. Take marks on the body of the visionary in the Christian stigmata or the modern UFO implant. Think communally witness alterations of gravity. Think about floating or levitating saints, Victorian mediums, or demon-possessed persons. People float in a lot of different circumstances. That makes no sense. Okay? But it happens. In these instances, it very much appears that the subjective and the objective are interacting in ways that violate any binary understanding of these two dimensions. It simply no longer makes any sense to separate mind and matter at this moment. Okay, I'm going to close with a single non-UFO, non-psychedelic example. This is, this is very typical one I hear a lot, but, but you'll, you'll see why it's unique. So I was lecturing at a major uh, research university in the north. I'm not allowed to tell you who this person is or where this university was. That's the first thing you should notice. Confidentiality is really important to a lot of people. There's something secret or embarrassing or intimate or explosive about these events. Um, afterwards, as usually happens, really as always happens, a colleague came up to me and asked me if she could tell me a story. I said, oh yeah, here we go. She then proceeded to describe the following series of historical events. A few years before we um, met, she had sent her four-year-old son up to a petting zoo north of the city with their nanny. Okay? At 10.06 a.m., this woman got a sudden flash of a picture in her head of her son screaming in his car seat in the back of the car and the car filling up with white smoke, which didn't make any sense. Smoke isn't white like that. Um, she knew it was a serious car crash, and she could also feel the impact in her body. This was a physical kind of sensation she had. She, of course, like all mothers, did one thing. What would you do? You call the nanny. And she told the nanny... Um, who was already at the petting zoo, to come home and to drive very slowly and to take side roads, which is what she did. Okay, so they got home just... The next day, the boy wanted to go back to the petting zoo. Mom, after all, had ruined his trip the day before. Um, so the mother decided to drive him up herself this time. She was not taking any chances. On the way there, a car made a sharp turn in front of them on the highway at a major crash sued. The son was screaming in the back car seat, exactly as in the, the vision. The airbags deployed and filled the car up with white powder, which was the white smoke. Um, the mother turned around to check on her son after the crash. That was when the flash from the day before replayed 
like a precise video rerun, she puts it. The man who hit them offered to call the woman's husband after the crash, since the woman could not get her phone. She was injured. The emergency call registered on her husband's phone at 10.08 a.m. So, so is this a mental or a material event? It is both. But what does that mean? The conventional scientists committed to some form of materialism or physicalism will try to claim that the story did not happen or that it is nothing more than a series of coincidences. But is that really convincing? It is rather pathetic response, to be honest, a flimsy piece of rhetoric that people believe because it confirms what they already believe. And yes, they believe materialism uh, and a one-way physical temporality. Clearly something else is happening here, though, and it has something to do with the imagination, with the movie going off in the mother's head, with what was shown to her. She misinterprets the visionary display. She thinks it is happening at that moment. And so she helps cause the future accident the next day. She would not have been driving then and there had she not ruined her boy's visit on the past. But the vision was trying to talk to her and probably warn her. Maybe it wanted to be misinterpreted as a clairvoyant cognition instead of a precognitive vision. The woman was no doubt more careful the next day because of the previous day's vision. Perhaps the vision wished to turn what could have been a deadly car accident into a very bad day and a set of addressable injuries. But from where or when did this agency act? Did the present mother unconsciously contact her future self? Or did the future mother contact her past self through the vision? Please also note that the vision was not me metaphorical in any sense. It was a quite literal replaying of a sensory experience. Does any of this make sense in our time-bound grammar and logic? No. Other paranormal events are much more Baroque or fantastic, of course. We can go through these, all kinds of discarded entities. There are physical events. There's radar. Can we read such events literally? I don't see how. Can we read them instead as symbolic attempts to communicate something of immense significance? Yes, I think we can. That is the great secret whispered in such moments but only if we can entertain the possibility that the imagination can act as a medium or translator of some other non-human or superhuman presence outside or to the side of our ordinary social existence. And by the way, that's what paranormal means. It means to the side of it. Ultimately, I think the imagination is another word for consciousness, neither of which we can understand for a very simple reason, because we are both. The eye cannot eye itself, but such an eye can, if comparative mystical literature means what I think it means, come to know itself as so. As the famous line from the medieval Christian professor had it, the eye with which I see God is the same eye with which God sees me. The eye of consciousness, the eye of God, can also come to appreciate the movies it throws up on its own historical and cultural screens special effects and all. It can believe, and it can disbelieve, and it does both. The ending. That's a lot, I admit. Still, it is my best shot. To sum up, what I think these archives of the impossible are all finally about is collecting and admitting as many dots as we can, and then seeing how we might connect them to form new pictures of ourselves on our mental and cultural screens. The challenge, of course, is that we ourselves are dots in the pictures we are trying to see. Characters in the stories we may no longer believe. But this itself is the beginning of an awakening. This itself is an early, if always incomplete, realization. Thank you.